please turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 12, and tonight we will read verses 5 and 6. We are studying the prophecy of the kings of the south and the north. This is the seventh lesson in this particular study. The Bible says, Then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others, one on this river bank, and the other on that river bank. And one said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, How long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? And that would be the title of this particular lesson, How Long? You will recall that the prophecy of the kings of the south and the north begins in chapter 10. At that time, Daniel was standing by the side of the Tigris River where he saw a vision of Christ who had come to give him the prophecy. So now at the end of the prophecy, he mentally comes back to where he is standing by the river and he sees two others, one standing on one side of the river and the other standing on the other side of the river. There is no indication in the scripture of who these others are, but it is likely they are angels that accompanied Christ on his visit to Daniel. I'm not given that information, but it just seems logical. Now in chapter 10, verse 7, we're told that some men were with Daniel at this time. They did not see the vision, but when the vision came to Daniel, they fled in terror from what they saw was happening. Now furthermore, the physical situation of these others, one on one side of the river and the other on the other side, does not appear to fit the circumstance of the men that had been with Daniel. So it is most likely these others were in fact angels and not any of the men who had been there with Daniel. They took off. We have no idea how long Daniel was standing there receiving this vision, but when he comes to, the guys that were with him are gone, and he, uh, these, two, these other two are standing there. Christ appears dressed in linen, and he is standing suspended over the water of the river. And someone speaks to him, asking the question, How long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Now, it is not perfectly clear who it is who speaks and asks the question. The Septuagint and the Revised Standard Version say, uh, I said, indicating that it is Daniel who is asking the question. The Masoretic text has he said, which is somewhat ambiguous, but it may suggest that it was one of the angels that asked the question. Other versions, including our New King James Version, have one said, and then some other versions have one of them said. So it is not perfectly clear immediately in the text who is asking the question. However, the scene portrayed in these verses seems to make it more likely that it was Daniel that asked the question. In any case, it is Daniel who records the conversation, and it is not essential to the prophecy who asked the question. Again, the question is, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Now, why would an angel be interested in knowing when the prophecy would be fulfilled? In one sense, it is meaningless to them, as they are only messengers ministering God's will. So, time is irrelevant to them. So why would they be interested in knowing when these are going to be fulfilled? To me, it seems more likely that Daniel would have an interest in the answer. And I think it is probably Daniel who asked the question. During his lifetime, Daniel received several prophecies 
and he was given some understanding as to what they meant. Now he had just been given this last prophecy in which he saw more of the awful destruction Epiphanes would bring on Judea and the religion of the Jews, specifically the desecration of the temple in Jerusalem. His thoughts had just been projected to the time of Messiah and the work of salvation he would bring. That was in the first four verses of chapter 12. So he's been giving, getting a mental workout here, seeing all this had happened with Epiphanes, projecting out to the coming of Messiah, and now he snaps back to where he is standing. Now as a Jew, he would be looking for a connection between the desecration of the temple and the work of redemption. If Messiah was coming to bring a redemption, salvation, then there had to be, in his thinking, some connection between the temple and this work. So it seems likely that the question that is asked concerns the cleansing of the temple so that Messiah would have a place from which to work when he does his work of deliverance. Now, Christ does not hesitate to answer the question. And he goes straight to the point, giving in verse 7 the answer that has two points. The answer is, it shall be for a time, times, and half a time. First part of the answer. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. Second part of the answer. The time reference, a time, times, and half a time, should be familiar to us after studying the prophecies of Daniel. We saw this time reference mentioned in the prophecy of the four beasts in Daniel chapter 7 verse 25, which referred to Herod the Great. That verse says, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High shall persecute the, persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. So that time symbol is used there, and it's used here in the 12th chapter. Now in chapter 7, the prophecy of the four beasts, the Hebrew word for time is Edom, which means a set time and technically a year. And we discussed that when we studied that prophecy. So in the seventh chapter, time, times, and half a time meant three and one half years. The word in Daniel, the twelfth chapter, that is translated time, times, is a different word. It's not the same word as in the seventh chapter. It is the Hebrew word moed, which has essentially the same meaning as Edom. James Strong, in his exhaustive concordance of the Bible, gives the definition as, properly, an appointment. That is, a fixed time or season. Specifically, a festival. Conventionally, a year. And then there are several other ways that that word is used that are not relevant to the prophecy. So, the first part of Christ's answer is that these things will be filled in a time, times, and half a time, or three and one half literal years. The second part of the answer is this when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered. And that refers to what we have already seen of Epiphanes making the Jewish religion illegal, profaning the temple by setting up idols, and putting to death those who continue to worship God according to the truth. While Antiochus Epiphanes and Herod the Great are not interchangeable personalities, there were certain similarities 
and the impact each had on the people of Judea that is warranted uh, in using the same symbol to describe them. Do you remember uh, we saw Herod the Great described as the little horn? Do you also remember we saw Antiochus Epiphanes described as the little horn? Two different little horns, but it's the same symbol used to describe them. And it's interesting and coincidental that this time symbol of three and a half years occurs uh, in the, the lives of both of these men. So it just points out that there are some similarities. They are not identical. They don't do the identical things, but they do affect the people of God in a negative way. Uh, it is also coincidental that this time symbol is used to refer to them. Now going on to verse 8. It says, although I heard, and this is Daniel speaking, I did not understand. Then I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Daniel, he says, he heard what Christ said, but he did not understand. So, why? Well, we can only speculate. But it may be his mind did hearken back to the prophecy of the four beasts when he heard about the three and one half years, and he became confused as it did not seem to apply to the same person in the present prophecy he had just been given. Now, I think this is rather unlikely, but it's just something that crossed my mind as a possibility. It also may be that Daniel was stunned by the direct answer to his question. I mean, Jesus just spoke out. Here's the answer. There's no him hoeing around, no uh, build up to it. He just said, here's what the answer to your question is. So it may have just been stunned, caught him off guard. So he asked the question again, perhaps just to be sure that he heard it correctly. You will notice that Christ does not repeat the answer. Instead, he tells Daniel the prophecy is sealed to the time of the end. To the time of the end. Notice that last phrase in what Christ said, to the time of the end. Earlier in verse 4 of the same chapter, it was said that the prophecy was sealed to the end of time. And here Christ says the prophecy is sealed to the time of the end. Now that's not just the two different ways of saying the same things. There is a difference in what the expression means. When we saw that in the verse 4, the end time, he was referring to the time in which we live when people would be studying and coming to understand what these prophecies mean. But the expression time of the end was applied to Antiochus Epiphanes in Daniel chapter 8 verses 15 to 27, the prophecy of the ram and the male goat. So Christ's use of the expression here focuses his answer on the time of the end for Epiphanes. That's why we know chapter 12 is a continuation of the prophecy of the kings of the south and the north because it's going to deal with the end of Antiochus Epiphanes. Verse 10, Jesus says to Daniel, Many shall be purified, made white, and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. The second part of Christ's answer concerned the shattering of the power of the holy people. In verse 10, that shattering appears to be cured. He says, many shall be purified, made what? And refined. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. But the wise shall understand. This statement appears to be related to what was said in verses 2 and 3 
concerning the deliverance Messiah would bring. Ultimately, the defeat and destruction of Antioch's Epiphanes prepared the stage for the Romans to take over Palestine. Under the rule of the Romans, the elements which would surround the ministry of Messiah were put in place. It was only a matter of time until that star shone over a lowly stable in Bethlehem, and Jesus of Nazareth, the unlikely Messiah, would come preaching the gospel of salvation from sin that would purify the souls of all who would receive it, making them white and refined before God. The wicked will reject the gospel and continue to do what they do, wickedness. Their desire for their own wickedness will prevent them from understanding the gospel. Jesus here sets up a deta detailed time frame in verse 11. He already said three and a half years before this. Now he comes down and he puts it in this context. From the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Now we know what he's talking about here. This is what Antiochus Epiphanes did. Remember, he stopped the daily sacrifices in the temple. And he committed the abomination of desolation. He took the statue of Zeus and put it into the temple. And then he made the worship of Jehovah God illegal. And he started killing people that would uh, not quit worshiping God. Now, this 1,290 days is... Uh, a curiosity that an awful lot of commentators have gone over and come up with uh, trying to point out when this particular church movement began and this particular church movement began and so forth in the Christian era. But keep in mind the first principle of Daniel, this 1290 days, has to take place in the time frame of the four empires. And it is talking about what Epiphanes did here. So it stands to reason that this 1290 days applies to the time of Antiochus Epiphanes. So those of us living at the end of time, there really is no mystery here if we know anything about history. As to the three and one half years mentioned in verse 7, those are actual years. And the 1,290 days are actual days. If you allow 30 days per month, which was according to the Jewish calendar, 1,290 days is, guess what? Three and a half years. No surprise. But it's interesting, Jesus uses 1,290 days and he didn't just say three and a half years again, because it ties in with what he says in the next verse. The sacrifice was taken away and the desolation set up in the month of Kislev in 167 BC. The temple was cleansed and the daily sacrifice restored under the Maccabees exactly three and one half years later in 164 BC. Jesus provides one more detail in verse 12 that figuratively drives a nail into the coffin of Antiochus Epiphanes. Jesus says, Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. You writing these numbers down? We have 1,335 days. We have 1,290 days. Brother Larry, our resident math whiz, what is the difference between 1,335 days and 1,290 days? 45 days. 45 days. 
It was a wonderful thing for Daniel to learn that the temple would be restored. And it is remarkable that it be, would be restored exactly three and a half years after the desecration. But it is remarkable that just 45 days after its restoration, Antioch's Epiphanes died, ending his reign of terror and preserving the sanctity of the temple and the faith of the Jews until the coming of Messiah. No mystery here. It's straight arithmetic, it's straight history. With this, we come down to one last verse, verse 13, which is a benediction that Jesus gives to Daniel and passes on to us. He says, but you, go your way till the end, for you shall rest and will arise with your inheritance at the end of the days. Daniel passed on into eternity. He is taking his rest. Those of us who live at the end of time, we have the benefit of history that we can look back over these prophecies and we can see the literal and exact fulfillment in these prophecies in history. It's exciting for us to know these things. How important is it for us to really know and understand these things? They're all in the past. We're not facing the Babylonians. We're not facing the Persians. We're not facing the Greeks. We're not facing the Romans. But we are facing the misuse and wrong interpretation of these scriptures. And those misinterpretations are being used to support false teachings of millenniums and uh, tribulations and, and so forth. We now know the truth that you cannot reach back into the book of Daniel to bring something out to talk about a rapture, to talk about a future kingdom of God. We know the truth, we're settled. We cannot be deceived by such teachings as those millennial teachings. How critical are teachings of the millennium compared to what we understand the end of time to be? Not really that significant. Oh yeah, there's different scenarios and like that. And one day it will be proven who's right and who's wrong. The danger is for those who are waiting for a future millennium and a future kingdom of God and believing that they're going to be brought back and have a second chance at salvation, they're going to be sorely disappointed because there is no second chance. And through studying the book of Daniel, we diffuse the errors that are perpetrated by reaching back to that book and applying them to those millennial teachings. We understand for our own security and safety. And who knows but that maybe God will allow us to share some of this with someone who may be deceived and waiting for something that's not going to happen for them the way they have been taught. Who knows? But we live in the end of time. We may all be alive when Christ returns and calls an end of time. Or we may join Daniel in the sleep of the blessed. Then we will rise along with Daniel and share in that inheritance that Daniel and the redeemed of all ages will enjoy for eternity. May God bless you, encourage you as you think back on these thoughts and the next time you read through the book of Daniel. God bless you. Amen.